I have been a professor here at KTH for the last 100 years, or sorry, 12 years. I get so <laughs> caught up in, in this theme, you know. And I'm going to talk about working on Venus and beyond this evening. And the challenge of working on Venus is the very high surface temperature, 460 degrees centigrade. So I'm not going to go there, but I'm proposing that we send a lander with electronics to do more research on Venus. And I've always been interested in science fiction, reading the books, watching the movies, Star Wars, there's one more coming now. And, and aren't we all, aren't we all interested if, <laughs> if, if there are aliens out there? I, I mean, this is, so, so finally I, I found that my work on electronics can be combined with my research interest in electronics, and, and that's great. So 100 years, what did, 100 years ago, what did we know about Venus? Well, maybe going more than 100 years ago, we didn't know that much about our planet or solar system. So we, we sort of made, had ideas with myths. We made myths uh, and gods and animals and everything. And, and we named the heavenly bodies after animals or uh, Greek gods like Venus. Hundred years ago, science fiction writers were writing about Venus and, and they envisioned that, well, maybe there are jungles and aliens. Uh, now we know a little bit better. But, you know, Venus is our sister planet. It's really close. Not, not this close, though. Th this figure is to show the relative size of Venus and Earth. That th They're roughly equal in diameter and mass. More important is that they both have an atmosphere. On Earth, oxygen and nitrogen and increasing amounts of carbon dioxide. We know about that. Whereas Venus, 96% carbon dioxide. So this is sort of global warming to its very extreme. <laughs> and, and, and this is actually the clue to why we want to find out more about Venus because we can learn a lot about climate modeling on Earth by also modeling the climate on Venus. And Venus has always been around. Uh, in the nighttime sky, it's only the moon that is brighter than Venus itself. So it can be seen to the naked eye. We, you don't need a telescope for it. And uh, depending on how it is positioned relative to Sun, it's either the morning star or the evening star. So this is how it's often referred to. Now, I'm not proposing that we should land for the first time on Venus, because it's already been done way back. I, I was barely born at this time, but Soviet Union, they launched several, both probes and later landers. And there was a whole series called the Venera landers. Actually should go up to 14, I mistyped that one. That, that all landed on Venus, and Venera is Russian for Venus, by the way. These landers, they're quite large. The, this is the Venera 13, it's 2.3 meters tall, 760 kilos, and it's carrying quite a lot of instruments, including the, the color camera that's on there, a TV camera. So these are actually color snapshots from Venus. So we can see rocks, and rocks, and rocks, and no aliens. Al although people have said, doesn't that look like a fish or a fish fossil? But no, we we're pretty sure there's not any sign of life yet. This, this is part of the lander. So this is for size reference, so that from the photos we can tell the size of the different rocks. And then over here, uh, these are actually enameled steel plates, so the color uh, can withstand the high temperature. And they were photographed on Earth before sending there, so that the whole images could be color corrected afterwards. So, so this, this is what we know about Venus. And already at the time of these landings, it was known that the temperature was 460 degrees C. So all of the electronics was enclosed in heat insulation. Even so, 
it didn't last longer than two hours. And then it was too hot. Electronics stopped working because this, this has uh, silicon electronics, the same thing you have in your laptops or mobile phones. So later uh, research has been done from orbiters, satellites going around and around Venus doing radar image mapping, um, both from NASA and from the European Space Agency and from JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. So a lot of what we know about Venus is information from orbiting. Uh, so for instance, this is a, a I think this is an image of a volcano. In any case, from, from orbits, we've been able to find out that there are probably volcanoes on Venus. You may wonder, well, what's, what's the big deal about that? Well, we know there's sulfuric acid. It's not just carbon dioxide in, a, in this atmosphere. And knowing the source of that sulfuric acid is important for doing the climate modeling properly. So the question is, are there active volcanoes or not? From the radar images, you can see that there are at least young volcanoes. And to find out whether there are active volcanoes and how active they are to make this climate modeling properly, you would need a lander to measure from the surface. So NASA has proposed some of these cute little vehicles that could scoot around. However, even if they have wheels, they can't really map out all of the volcanoes on Venus. I mean, it's a huge planet. What we're proposing instead in this project is an immobile lander that just sits there and measures Venus quakes, not earthquakes. Because the Venus quakes are a sign of volcanism going on. So I repeat again, the 460 degrees centigrade and the carbon dioxide. Also, the, the pressure of the atmosphere is 92 times that of Earth. So these are some extreme conditions that need to be withstand by an, any lander going to Venus. And then, now I have to admit that I, I made a mistake when I made these slides, because I, I made the slides beforehand, and then as I was preparing what to say to the slides, I realized I forgot to mention the key piece of information here. It's not mentioned on a single slide that what we're proposing is not silicon electronics, but silicon carbide. And this is the key to building a lander that could withstand these temperatures. So silicon carbide is a semiconductor much like silicon, but it can work at 460, 500, 600, 800, maybe even 1000 degrees centigrade, unlike silicon. Both silicon and silicon carbide as semiconductors were discovered almost 200 years ago by Jens Jakob Berzelius, the Swedish chemist. So, so these are not new things. The new thing is being able to build all of the electronics for a lander in this new material. So for a, for a lander, of course, we need a seismic sensor. Uh, this is proposed to be a, a MEM sensor where, where you have, you measure the capacitance between a mobile or um, uh, piece of silicon and that's flexing between a fixed part and the capacitance changes uh, as there are movements, yeah. Venus quakes. But this signal is, is too weak to, to do anything with, so we need amplifiers. A stands for amplifier. And then these analog signals are converted in analog to digital converters to ones and zeros. And we could have several sensors. We can have gas sensors, maybe temperature sensors, pressure sensors, some image sensor. All of them have different amplifiers and AD converters and collected by the MCU or microcontroller unit. You can think of this like an Arduino maybe or a, a laptop. It needs some memory to store all of this data. And then in the system, we envision that there is a satellite to relay all of the signals back to Earth. So when the satellite passes over the lander, it sends down a signal, I'm here, 
and then the MCU answers, okay, this is the data we collected since last time. Uh, if there's an error in the transmission, it's still in the memory, so it can retransmit until all of the data is up there. And the microcontroller can also do some data treatment or filtering. So whenever nothing has happened, when there's only zeros coming from the seismic sensor, it doesn't need to send them. When there is an event, it, it collects all of that data and sends it in higher resolution. It will also need a, a power supply unit for all of this. And then RTG stands for Radio Isotope Thermal Generator. You can think of it as a plutonium battery. So, so that's a power source that can actually withstand these temperatures and last for 10 or 20 years. But to build this system, we have to do this step by step. We started with smaller building blocks, digital building blocks like the NAND gate. So then we, we start out from circuit schematics, four to five transistors, some resistors, and then we make mask layouts where we envision how the different components will fit uh, on top of the silicon carbide wafer. The next thing is to go into the clean room. Uh, this is also KTH, but in Shista. If you've been to Shista, maybe you've seen this building. And th this one is only 30 years old, not 100, but we still like it. <laughs> and inside of this clean room, uh, these are not space suits, these are bunny suits that are used in the clean room. They keep um, skin particles and hair from the operators away from the wafers. This is a wafer of silicon carbide. These are about 100 millimeters in diameter. So on each wafer you could have 100 or 1000 integrated circuits. And this is what the integrated circuit from the previous slide looks like once it's been made, with the metallization being this shiny area. Uh, the next thing is to measure these at high temperature in our lab. So these, what, what you see here are scratches made by tungsten needles. So with XYZ micromanipulators, we put down the needles on top of the wafer and they scratch a little bit and then we can uh, measure electrically that these are working and at the same time uh, we heat the hot plate up to 500 or even 600 degrees centigrade so we're sort of simulating Venus but on Earth. So, so far we've, we've made many of these logic gates with a few transistors. We've made the amplifiers, 25 transistors maybe, analog to digital converters, now we're up to 100 or 200 transistors and all of these have been tested up to at least 500 so we know that they will work on Venus. Presently my PhD students are working on this, it's the microcontroller, it has memory, 128 bits, not very impressive, um, it's about 6000 transistors. Now in, compar in comparison to silicon this is not very impressive at all. Your mobile phone or laptop has six billion transistors, so one million times more. However, your mobile phone or laptop will not work on Venus. This one will. So, so that's, that, that's our selling point. And I also said I'd say something about beyond Venus. So you heard in the previous talk about the Jupiter Moon's mission. There are also other planets in the solar system worth exploring more, like Mercury, closer to the Earth. Now, we're not on any of these missions yet, but I'm sure there will be more missions to some of these very extreme environments in our solar system. However, I usually tell my students that, you know, you will never be rich designing space electronics. The big money is here in terrestrial applications on Earth. We're doing these space things to attract the funding from the funding agencies. Because this is, I mean, we're, we're aiming high and uh, it gets the exposure and the PR by, by doing this for space missions. Uh, but there are many environments on Earth that are these temperatures as well. Volcanoes, combustion processes, 
jet engines, uh, and all of these uh, could use high temperature electronics very close to the combustion processes to improve the energy efficiency. Another area is uh, nuclear energy. Uh, so, uh, in a nuclear reactor, you, have, you can have both high temperature and also large amounts of radiation. And silicon carbide is, is a good candidate for this electronics as well. Sometimes it goes wrong, like the incident in Fukushima. So now, one reactor hall, any electronics they send in die immediately from the very high amount of radiation. So this is an area that's extremely interesting to build electronics that could last for a little longer than silicon electronics. So it, the, so the building could be explored and uh, eventually sanitized. So at this point, many people say, well, this is really cool. And, and then I say, no, it's, it's really hot. <laughs> this is hot electronics. And you might wonder, well, how long is it going to take before we, we can do this? So w with this theme of 100 years, I say, well, within 100 years, I'm sure we can do this. <laughs> but uh, I personally surely hope we can send this to Venus before my retirement so that, that I can get to see the results of doing this. Thank you for listening.